Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you once again for joining us at The Hub, presented by Capital Workspaces in Bethesda, Maryland. Our guest today is Tony Stroud Hamilton of Pizzeria Paradiso. Pizzeria Paradiso has become an institution for wood-fired Neapolitan-style pizza and craft beer in the D.C. area since 1991. How are you, Tony? I'm doing quite well. Thanks Good. for having me. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And as you we were chatting about um, recently first tasting your pizza, delicious. Awesome. Oh, my God. Thank <laughs> you so f- very much for um, adding to our most recent event in Spring Valley. And I was asking about a certain type of pizza that I had, either eggplant or potato. Oh, my God. I'd never even heard of anyone using potato. Pumpkin was the wildest. I mean, it's grown since other pizza Businesses have flourished, but never potato, but it was so good. So what area are you from? Uh, well, originally, I'm actually from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. That's right. We have another. We keep getting these North Carolina folk in here. <laughs> a lot and, of people from North Carolina seem like they make it up to D.C. Oh, know? yeah. The, I don't know why. The, another great migration. Yeah. So how long have you been up here? Uh, so uh, since 2009. Uh, okay. I graduated from college. I went to UNC Chapel Hill and... Uh, <laughs> we moved up here right afterwards, and uh, it, it, DC kind of felt like a, a a slightly larger version of Chapel Hill, North Carolina. It okay, was, it was interesting. All right, so and you majored in theater. I did, and a chemistry minor. Hmm. I I did the pre med track and theater track because I couldn't decide. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm down for it. That's that's an interesting combination. Mm-hmm. So theater and pre med. So, but you made a decision to. Hey, that's not for you? Well, as I say the original reason was Patch Adams. The movie was really big. Oh, my God. So Robin Williams. Yeah. Yes. So that just kind of inspired me to want to do both simultaneously. Okay. Uh, but then I actually I saw Wicked on Broadway uh, my freshman year of college. and was like, yes. all right, I'm, I'm almost certainly going to do theater at this point, but I'll stay as a pre-med track as well just to keep my parents happy. Ah, that's funny, <laughs> which a lot of us have done. Mm-hmm. I love the photos of you on Facebook. I love it. And what was that festival called, the one that I shared the picture of you with? What was that? Pretty much all the pictures that I think you were looking at with me and Garb were from various Renaissance fairs. Okay. Uh, one of them, I think, was me as Sir Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester at okay. the Virginia Renaissance Fair, okay. uh, which is where my wife and I have performed for, well, for about 13 years now. Wow. Uh, and the other one was from the New York Renaissance Fair, where we go up as guest performers sometimes. And my wife is a customer, so she uh, does all of our work and makes a lot of other people's garb as well. Oh, crazy, crazy interesting. So if, even though she's in theater as well, what mm-hmm. is that all that she does right now? Yeah, I mean, she she had a lot of, you know, tricky times with the pandemic as well. She had actually just graduated from grad school in costume design and production right before the pandemic. So really excited to to dive into the theater scene and then <laughs> all theater closed. Oh, man. So we were incredibly fortunate that I had a position with Pizzeria Paradiso that I was able to keep my job and we were able to, you know, I was able to support us through those first couple of really tough years. Okay. Uh, and she just kind of had to wait. Okay. She got really good at taking care of plants and mm. taught herself how to cook. A lot of the talents came out of mm-hmm. the pandemic. We've been talking about that. Things people had enough quiet time to think about and reflect on. You mm-hmm. know, I'm not busy working. So what do I really love to do? She, yeah. She thought she had a thumb that was very, very, you know, brown. But yeah. she actually had a green thumb that she just hadn't really cultivated yet. Okay, great. So you guys met each other in college or on the theater scene? College, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sophomore year of college, uh, dated all through college, different colleges, which was even more challenging. And okay. then moved up to D.C. together and uh, got engaged a few years after that. Got married a few years after that. Uh, we just kind of did it in threes, it seemed. Okay. Uh, and just kind of took it slow. And now we've been married f- uh, since... 2015. So congratulations. Thanks. Yeah, Andrew's a newlywed as well. So congratulations yes, yeah. to both of you guys. Yeah. So uh, Pizzeria Paradiso is owned and operated by Chef Ruth Gresser. This DC classic is best known for its delectable crust. And I really have oh, to yeah. say, 
It really is good. I am not a thick crust person. Anytime I've ever ordered pizzas, I always uh, prefer a thin crust. But the way that you guys set it up and the different versions of it, like the veggie pizza was mm. so very good. And I took a, uh, a look at some of your toppings. Now, how often do you guys... Let me say, I guess, in, do you guys regularly invent new pizzas or, because I see for September, you are having your specialty pizza, succotash, yeah. herb aioli, grata padano. Yeah, which is just a, another version of Parmesan. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. And country ham. Yeah. Okay. So, quick question. Is there a pizza specialty that you guys create every month? Is the same throughout the year? Yeah, so we currently do a monthly special pizza. I okay. usually try to cater it to either, you know, something that that month is known for or tied into the season. Okay. We used to do, pre-pandemic, uh, a special pizza every week. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the, just seeing my memories of the spreadsheet that they had <laughs> to keep track of all the specials was uh, overwhelming. I'm sure. So <laughs> do, those all of those specials, are they now flowing into the menu on a regular basis or you're— uh, so we we basically still have that kind of running list of all of our most successful specials, okay. especially the ones that work really well for repeat annual things okay. um, based on the season. So, you know, next month is going to be um, our classic apple and Brussels sprouts. Oh. Um, yeah, it's very seasonal. Apple in the fall. Yeah. on a pizza. I was afraid you're going to say pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> We've done that in the oh. past, too. That's great. You know, this is pumpkin spice worlds as a la Starbucks, but. We do a pumpkin pesto every now and then. Pumpkin pesto. Homemade. Of course. Yeah. Pesto is made out of a a nut or something. So pesto sort of in our sense, it just indicates that it is not a tomato sauce. It is just sort of a sauce blended with herbs, cheese, olive oil. Okay. Uh, The traditional basil pesto typically does have pine nuts in it. There you go. Uh, That's what I was thinking of. We we actually like to make ours a little bit more approachable for people with allergies. So we actually don't use nuts in any of our sauces, uh, including our pesto. So both our basil pesto and our spicy garlic pesto um, are nut free. Uh, and they they don't need it really. It's delicious regardless. Oh, you it is the the Genovese, the potato pizza with the pesto, and it's great. Oh, it's delicious. The mm. selections that you had, they like flew off the table. <laughs> so it says opening in 1991. Yeah. You guys say that you have a commitment to quality. That's what makes the difference at Pizzeria Paradiso. So you have four locations: one in Georgetown, Old Town Alexandria, Spring Valley, woohoo, and Hyattsville. I used to live in the Hyattsville area. So, um, do you guys have plans on, even though that's the newest one in Hyattsville, do you have any plans on branching off into any other locations? Well, actually, so I'm going to tweak a couple things with that. that okay, may have been a, an older um, thing, possibly, or I, maybe I you know, shared something wrong. Um, so our Old Town location unfortunately did not survive the pandemic oh yeah okay it was, uh, yeah tough you know obviously for everyone tough times uh and that location just you know negotiations with landlords were difficult and okay. you know business Understandably. was just tough in that area so uh that one actually yeah did not make it uh we do still have four locations we originally had uh five uh pre-pandemic uh dupont circle is the the one i think that we were missing yeah. George, georgetown dupont circle Hyattsville, Maryland, and Spring Valley. Uh, funnily enough, I opened uh, two of those locations in my time with Paradiso. Okay. So you started off as a server. Yeah. So how I've seen many people in business start off very, um, at a, maybe a entry-level position and then grow. How was that succession for you? Is that something that you planned? I see that you <laughs> stayed because of the the familiar feel the character building, what you've learned from the company itself and its owner and founder, but how was that progression and how did you decide just to say, you know what, this is what I want to stick with? Uh, I mean, it's a funny story. It's just sort of even the, the uh, how I found Paradiso in the first place is kind of serendipitous and just the, the many ways that have kept me with the company kind of all just sort of led me to this point, which just almost feels sort of, you know, like fate. Funnily enough, when I first moved up to the D.C. area, uh, I was knew I was going to do theater. So I knew, great, I'm going to work in a restaurant. That's cool. Um, I got some experience in college, so I knew I could apply and see what happens. So I immediately got hired at Macaroni Grill. Oh, my goodness. In, yeah, it's been there. Yeah, downtown Silver Spring, which is no longer there. It did not stay very long. 
And I knew I wasn't a big fan of that corporate kind of style mm -hmm. of service and, and management in general, but I just needed a gig, you know, gotcha. a job I to completely kind of, understand. We were moving from North Carolina to DC and the prices were a little different. So, uh, but funnily enough, I missed the training date. I got the date wrong and they only do training every two weeks. So they were basically said, you know, we've got another training course in two weeks. We'll see you then. Or if you can't, then oh well. Real. Uh, so I was like, well, I need money. So I got on the red line and literally went out to about Friendship Heights and then got off every single stop leading back to Silver Spring. I and just walked in a little radius around the metro stop no. and applied at every restaurant that wow. I could. And the only one that hired me, that interviewed me at all and then hired me on the spot was Pizzeria Paradiso. No, get out of here. Yeah. And that was at the DuPont Circle location. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. And look at you. Wow, that's, <laughs> that's very interesting. So... Does, um, I'm sorry, her name, Miss Gresser. Yeah, Ruth. Ruth. Mm -hmm. How close, I guess, are you? Because it seems like it has a very family feel to mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So how, I guess, since she's the owner and I guess um, people that are employed there, how close would you say you are to her and the business model? Or do you get an opportunity to um, have an in or a say so to where the business develops? Yeah, definitely. And, and sort of, I guess, connecting back to what you were asking about, just sort of like, growing with the company and progressing, yes, um, yes. you know, they always love the idea of promoting from within and sort of, you know, cultivating people who understand and believe in Paradiso. And just, you know, I was there just as a server to start, but just everything that, that I now love just kind of seeps into you the longer mm -hmm. that you're there, just the sort of culture of support and respect oh for employees yes, uh, and care and concern uh, yeah. just kind of all makes you want to be there. And it, it sort of fed into how I like to manage now, uh, it, mainly the idea that your staff should want to be there and yes. should enjoy showing up to work and not be like, oh, I got to show up to parody. I'm just now. a warm body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they it should be a, a comforting, happy environment where if that, if your staff feels that and feels that support and that just happiness that it can't help but translate to the customers. Yeah. It's the, contagious. Yeah. You, you know, so I, that's always sort of been my, the ethos that I picked up on when I was serving and what I ultimately tried to, to foster when I became, you know, upper level management and things like that. Okay. And that came all the way up from Ruth. Uh, I think the, the story that she always told that kind of stuck with me the most that I just sort of try to always keep in my heart and love to kind of share with both employees and customers if they're curious is when she was trying to envision her, her perfect place of the business that she was in charge of. She pictured herself and her teammates standing around the fire, the wood burning fire, oh, man. Uh, laughing, just having a good time, yeah, enjoying yeah. each other's company. Yeah. And so that sort of just image is what always kind of, you know, informs how I like to kind of the atmosphere that I like to create. Yeah. Because of her, they, they bought into what her vision was. Yeah. yeah. I love that idea. I've worked in retail, weighted tables, clients of Georgetown mm -hmm. uh, for many years. And once you buy in and you do get that support, those people become like family because you're with them a lot more yeah. hours throughout the day than you are with your family. Yeah. So having that support and it's teamwork because yeah. you have a goal at the end of the day, even though you want to make sales goals, those numbers have to be met. But when you really like and start to love and care for the people that you work for, it really does make a difference. Well, and kind of what you said with teamwork, that's that's sort of another thing that just made sense to me. Yeah. Is Paradiso's model is we do a team service concept instead of you have your individual section and you only make your money off that one section. Oh. We do tip pooling and team service. So it just automatically encourages you to care about not only your, your teammates yes. because you're all, the more you help each other, mm -hmm. the more well, efficient each other can and grow. effective. But also it forces you to, not forces you, it encourages you to care about every single customer in that space. Yeah. You're not just concerned about the one or two people, you know, in your section. You're concerned about every single customer that you walk past because they're paying you too. Yes. Uh, and so just it created this wonderful team environment where everyone just sort of supported each other and helped each other and had each other's back. Yeah. Uh, so just it all just sort of culminated in these great things uh, that just made me 
happy to be at work. And you know, not only that, they the company would really take care of its its staff. Yeah, you know? employees that matters. Ruth was providing benefits uh, for full time employees before any of it was ever mandated. Okay, uh, you know, health insurance for full time employees, uh, vacation days, four hundred one k. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, it was kind of unheard of in a restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> like you're seeing a little bit more and more, you know, Starbucks and things like that are doing. Yeah. It. And some of, you know, the bigger corporate spaces do that. But the fact that, you know, as not even a manager yet, just as a full time server, I had the option once I became, you know, kind of full time hours to start a 401k, you know, in my late 20s. In the restaurant industry, oh my blew goodness. my mind. Love four hundred one k. Yeah, love the match. Amazing. Yeah, so I hate this- the. <laughs> I don't know about the being fully vested part, but the four hundred one k, especially when you're young yeah. and you're married and you want to save up money for a certain these houses or cars or stuff. Oh yeah, that's that puts you at a great advantage. Yeah. I want to talk about. I want to hope pronounce. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing this correctly. Berreria. Mm. Paradiso. That's said better than most anyone else I hear <laughs> attempting it the first time. Okay, yeah. so I usually just say uh, say beer and area and put it together. <laughs> beer area. <Yeah. laughs> okay. Yeah. If you want to be Italian and roll the R, it's Birreria. Birreria. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, so anyone with a growing interest in micro brews and handcrafted beer, what is a micro brew? Yeah, well, I mean, it just sort of refers to like small batch kind of like okay. low production breweries and things like okay. that. Okay, okay. Uh, or, you know, the actual just beer itself being something that was brewed in a small batch ultimately is okay. the best way I could, I think, describe it. Um, okay. Ultimately, we made the choice a while ago. You know, our beer program for a long time uh, has been dedicated to serving really well crafted beer, not that we craft, but from just uh, craft breweries. And we made the decision a while ago to actually only sell independent I read breweries. That. Yeah. I think this needs serve local. Yeah. And yeah. it doesn't even have to necessarily be, you know, front and down the street. It, we try to, you know, distribute, you know, receive beer from small breweries all over the country, even okay. from across you know, the globe as well. I like that. And it, you know, it definitely means that some of those big things like Guinness and Bud Light and things like that, that is well known to a lot of people is not something you're going to find on our menu, but we try to train our staff to be knowledgeable and, and capable of making great recommendations. Absolutely. Yeah. My, my kind of go-to is like, we don't have that. Anything you've seen a commercial for, we don't have, but I've got things similar and better. Yeah. Sell them, um, invite them to try something um, new. Yeah. You say that you have everything from I mean, a novice to an aficionado. Mm-hmm. You have 12 plus draft beers and over 200 Bottled beers? It's probably whittled down from that number at this point. We definitely had that uh, pre-pandemic for sure. Man, I'm I'm not a beer drinker, but (laughs) I could not even think, well, grocery store, how much can they carry? I could not even imagine over 200 different versions of bottled beer. Yeah. Okay, and I've worked in restaurants. And I know the draft ones they have, ones they have on tap, but that's crazy interesting. So, just as an interest to you, what is your favorite beer? Well, do you drink beer? Oh yeah. Okay, what is your favorite? Oh man, I mean, it's almost more a question of what style of beer am I feeling oh, that day? Excuse me. Yeah, <laughs> it's well, it's crazy. Like that I've experienced so many beers at this point that it's more just like, what am I feeling? It's the same question people ask me when they say, "What's your favorite pizza on the menu?" Uh, I usually say it depends on the day. Okay. Uh, it, there's some days where I'm like, I really am digging like a you know something decadent, and mm. I'll do like our our Batarga pizza, which has like cured fish roe, egg. I add mozzarella, pancetta. So you've got like a bacon, egg, and cheese pizza with cured caviar on top. Sir. And you just want to take a nap. Sir. Oh my, I, I was napping. Oh my, <laughs> had my eyes closed as you were describing it. Oh my mm. goodness. Uh, but it's kind of the same thing with beers. It kind of depends on the day. Some days I want something light and crisp and simple, more like just a clean IPA. But a lot of times I really dig like the more indulgent Belgian style beers that are kind of darker, richer, have more like effervescence to them and just more flavor. Okay. Sometimes I want something a little more exotic and I want like a sour ale or something that's just going to make your your tongue kind of dance okay. with a little bright tartness and a zing to it. Okay. I think I have the palate of a heathen because <laughs> I don't think that I can capture the taste of beer. Sometimes I'm just like, 
All right, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm serious. I'm just like, yeah. I don't think my tongue has that. But you've made it so interesting. It really does make me want to try it. But yeah. your pizza selections? Ooh, yeah. Oh, my yeah, goodness. That's what we're known for. So what are there? Is there only two types of crust or how many type, different types of crust are there? So, I mean, we have our just our classic. So we do Neapolitan style pizza. Yes. So it's not, you know, New York style. It's not Chicago style. It's somewhere in between almost. Okay. It's, you know, the thin crust ultimately that the outer edge kind of puffs up a little bit. Yes. It's got just kind of this just doughy, cloudy <laughs> yes. wonderfulness to it. Light crisp on the outside mm-hmm. with just nice soft melting center almost. Um, and so that's like our classic just white crust that we do. We also have a wheat crust that's the same version, just for using whole wheat. Yay. Um, and we do also have a gluten-free crust option. Oh, yeah, yeah. That we okay. make in-house as well. Um, that's just in the personal, like, nine-inch size just because a lot of work and, you know, labor goes into it. Okay, cool. Um, but those are kind of our three crust options. We can do the the two regular wheat and white crust thin uh, for those that really want that kind of, like, more traditional thin crust style. but. Okay. For the classic Neapolitan style, it's just that wonderful doughiness on that that outer crust. Oh, there. it's delicious! And I'm a little smaller now, but inside I'm a big, big girl, and I love food. Even though my mm. palate is, I love trying different foods. Yeah. I love arugula on pizza. I love oh, anything with a salad on top of a pizza yeah. is absolutely delicious. So, um, thank you for that. I also want to jump into your theater <laughs> background. How often do you get an opportunity to do any kind, because you're so busy in management with the store, how often do you get an opportunity to, well, do you audition or try out for things? How does that go? How does that work into your life? Well, it's tricky. I mean, for the longest time, you know, for about, um, I guess, nine years or so since when we first moved up here, I I found the balance between, you know, the acting pursuits and, you know, you know, working at pizzeria. And then I would just constantly kind of grow with the company and and kind of work my way up from server to floor manager to assistant general manager to ultimately general manager for a couple of different locations now. And so, you know, obviously as those responsibilities grew, the, the availability to pursue other things became more difficult. And by the time I committed to become a general manager four years ago, plus or minus, um, that coincided with my wife starting grad school for costume design. Whew. So it was sort of one of those moments where it felt just like the right thing for us in our relationship and just our lives going forward to, for me to step back from theater and to focus on supporting us getting through, getting okay. her through grad school. Cause she wasn't going to really be able to work much in the way of full time or even schedule. part-time. Yeah. yeah. Um, she did actually get to work some part-time through her graduate program to, you know, assist where she could, but I was definitely kind of, you know, pulling in the the necessary bucks to of get course. us through. Um, so I definitely haven't gotten to do as much recently. Kind of my main outlet uh, for the past few years has been the Renaissance Fair. Okay, um, That's just kind of been our passion just as a couple uh, ever since I met her, basically. She started she started performing at the North Carolina Renaissance Fair uh, sophomore year of high school. Oh, wow. A long so time. I can't even do that math right now. It's like <laughs> 16, 17 years that she's been a fair performer. Oh, so wow. uh, to the point where she is now and has been for the past six, seven years, uh, the queen at the Virginia Renaissance Fair, oh. uh, which is no small feat. And she is absolutely astounding in what she does. Oh, I love the pictures of it, both of you together. Yeah. And it's, you know, we look that good because she made it all. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Give it a, um, shout outs to the wife. What, now, what's your wife's name? Stacy. St- oh, my sister's name. It, she's an S-T-A-C-I-E. What is your wife's ah, name? S-T-A-C-E-Y. E-Y. I mean, Go for the Stacys. Both of them with the E, though. She's she's always like the ones with just a Y, like they don't exist. Oh, no. <laughs> I love it. She sounds like Jesse. <laughs> That's um, Andrew's wife. That's so cool. Yeah. So what is because... I've never attended a Renaissance mm. Festival. What is the period of time and what is the Renaissance Festival? Yeah. So, I mean, what most people, especially in this area right here, are familiar with is probably the Maryland Renaissance Festival. Yes, I've heard of it. Yeah. Uh, so that one's not far. It's about half an hour, 45 minutes from D.C. Uh, and that one is based in King Henry's time period. Okay. So like the early 1500s, um, something like that. Um, and that's been that for decades now. Uh, okay. The one, most of the other Renaissance fairs, especially on like the East Coast, 
take place in the Elizabeth I reign. Okay. Uh, so we're like uh, 1585, something like that, somewhere around there. The way we always say it's that it's a chapter in the history book, not a page. Uh, so when people are like, what year exactly are you based in right now? I'm like, well, we're we're loose. You know, Shakespeare was technically a, a baby, basically, when Elizabeth was like in her main reign. Oh, okay. Like, Shakespeare didn't really come to any kind of prominence until she was basically about to die. Oh, wow. Um, so like that, that's already sort of this fun little kind of idiosyncrasy with history of people going to the Renaissance Fair being like, it's Queen Elizabeth and also Shakespeare <laughs> and he's performing for her, but he's actually a baby right now. So uh, that's funny. Chapter, not a page. I love that. Yeah. I love that. So recent history, recent news. Mm. Yeah, yeah. The Queen's passing. Yeah. So any thoughts as far as your acting and what you've done or period or anything? Well, I'll, I'll say the, the funny thing first, uh, just to get it out of the way, and then I can be more serious. <laughs> okay. um, so, you know, my wife plays Queen Elizabeth the first, but plays Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, one of our jousters, uh, <laughs> the, the day of the Queen's passing, I got a Facebook message from him that literally just said, sorry for your loss. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's cute. Yeah. I like that. So, That's cute. So my response was, uh, never fear. My queen is still alive and well. <laughs> my, never fear. My queen is still here. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it's interesting. My, you know, my connection to Queen Elizabeth and just the, the whole concept of England and English history and all that is obviously a little bit more, uh, I guess, colorful just because of my background with the Renaissance Fair. Like yeah. I've done, you know, in-depth research into the character that I've played for years, Sir Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, who was the guy who got the closest to marrying Queen Elizabeth I, actually. Oh. So it works well in performances. And why didn't that work out? Uh, well, she's called the Virgin Queen for a reason. Oh. She, she, oh, so yeah. Can I even say that? Yeah. Okay. No, no. He said, can I say that? Look, that's easy. Hey, yeah, please say that. Sure. <laughs> No, no, uh, her sort of nickname, I mean, that's what Virginia is called, Virginia, because no, and I'm she was from a virgin, virgin queen. Yeah, didn't know. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she made the active choice to never marry for a few reasons. Like, Stacey, my wife, can tell you all of her very specific, like, I've made these acting choices based on this history because this is what I think. We'll never fully know all of her reasons, but a lot of the main reasons were that she did not want to cede power if she married a man, he would become king. And in those times, kings were still ultimately considered to be the true monarch. So if she married someone, unless she put it into like the books that he just be a king consort and have no real authority, she would have had to give up some of her power. Uh, also, she saw what happened to her mom uh, when she was married, uh, Anne Boleyn. Oh, uh, the Boleyn girls. Yeah. Yeah, didn't, didn't I remember that. I saw the movie. So well. Ooh. Yeah. Interesting. And, and <laughs> That's all my references. Was it was in a yeah. movie? Yes, it was. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, and, you know, childbirth at that time was dangerous. So, like, the oh. idea of creating, you know, marrying just to have an heir was not worth it for her because she was like, I could die. I don't want to yeah. risk that. I'd rather just be queen as long as I can mm. and have a great time. And she did. Yeah. Oh, um, wow. So, yeah, it's just I— the idea of a monarch and and what they represent to the country and sort of their their presence and and how they connect to everything how like the identity of a country can be so tied around a person is very different for a monarch versus something like just a president yeah it it goes deeper than just political affiliations so even now in this kind of modern age I still, you know, got the sense that it affects a lot of people. You know, just thinking back to like Princess Diana and and how her passing kind oh, of my, really, affected the world, yeah. but, but because of the woman that she was. Yeah, exactly. Even though we talked about how poorly treated she may may have been by her family, mm -hmm. she had such an, uh, a prominent effect on the entire world, like a Mother Teresa. Yeah. Because she traveled globally to spread the message, and just her kindness was unmatched. Do you have any um, other interests? Even I mean, because you're an artsy guy, that's in that's one of your passions. Have you ever thought about television or movies or anything in the future? Because you know anything could happen. 
Yeah. I mean, you know, the, one of the things that my wife and I kind of, the slogan we came up with when I decided to step back from theater and kind of focus on, you know, becoming full-time and general manager with Paradiso was that, you know, as long as I can crawl onto the stage, like I can, oh, I can wow. get back onto that stage anytime I need. I've okay. always loved theater specifically, the, yeah. you know, performing on the stage. I am kind of my antics are a bit larger than life. Um, so the idea of stage, uh, sorry, uh, film and TV, it's a very different style of acting that I would, I would want to do a lot more training and okay. preparation to get into that. Obviously if, you know, Spielberg re- hits me up, I'm not going to say, Hey, no. what, are you, what are we doing next week? Gotcha. Hey, I'm there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like War of the Worlds three. Yeah. 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 I can be Tom Cruise. Great I'm short. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I might need to stretch a little bit. He will definitely outrun yeah. me. Yeah. Work me work out a little bit. Yeah, exactly. But may I ask, in your theater, and maybe a dub moment, there is some singing you do, right? Yeah. I, you know, did you know, training, some training in college and stuff like that. Okay. But in your uh, Renaissance acting, mm-hmm. do you sing in the Renaissance Festival? Um, Only if the Queen asks me to but i usually i usually <laughs> offer to perform my uh one of my bits is that i have what i call internal bagpipes oh um, please let I, us hear them please I, can the speakers handle it okay can you uh, <laughs> andrew our I mean, audio you, guy is like go for you, it you're aware of bagpipes and how many people claim that they sound like you know, you're beating a bag of cats against a wall right uh, I'm ready to hear it. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, my bit is that hey, I'm happy to perform my internal bagpipes uh, where I, you know, have my own system in in place. Uh, so and then usually it just I see how long I can go for someone's like, please stop, please stop, please stop, please stop. So start waving at me when you okay. need me to stop. <clears throat> All right. Here we go. <clears throat> That's just like a lower pitch. I didn't do the high pitch. I was <laughs> waiting for it. <laughs> All right. Oh. Wow. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Copyright. That's copyright. I know. Right? <laughs> No one else try that, please. Thank you for that. Well, I was, re- honestly, I was waiting for you to, like, belt out a song of that. But thank you so <laughs> much for that. Let's get back to this pizza, okay? Yeah. Let me just say some of the ingredients that I noticed, and I was just like, okay, got to try those. Some of the proteins. Anchovy. Paradiso lamb sausage. Now, let me ask this. When you say the term paradiso before chicken sausage or paradiso lamb sausage, what does that mean? That means we make those in house. Oh, yeah. Oh, duh. Paradiso, the name. Okay. Yeah. No, is it? I mean, a lot of people don't don't catch that. And okay. Yeah. So our, all three of our sausages and our meatballs we make in house. Okay. So let me just ask this. I'm not sure if this will be a secret, proprietary. There are no animals in a vet, right? No. <laughs> there are no. I don't know. Yeah, that that would be a different. Uh, <laughs> License, I think, with yeah. the health department, we would have had to get. <laughs> just want to throw but that out like there. Our, our lamb sausage, we make with lamb that's sourced from just a farmer up in Pennsylvania. Cool. He's also the one who brings us our goat cheese as well, like fresh off his farm. Every two weeks, he just comes down with fresh goat cheese the and lamb. The best cheese in the world is goat cheese. Yeah, and our goat cheese is great. It's like wow. strong and flavorful. Yeah, it's real good. Pipe, Pipe Dreams Farm. Shout out to them. <laughs> yes, pipe dreams. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so prosciutto. I try to stay away from this. A little bit too salty for me. But you have paradiso chicken sausage, paradiso lamb sausage, paradiso meatballs, mm-hmm. paradiso pork sausage. Oh my goodness! So your cheese. <laughs> I'm serious. Asiago buffalo mozzarella. Yeah. What is <laughs> buffalo mozzarella? Uh, prior to what a lot of people might assume, it is not spiced with buffalo sauce. Um, it is actually <laughs> cheese made from the milk of a water buffalo. Um, so it's, Hold on. it's what you actually see, like that's a traditional kind of fresh mozzarella that you yeah. see sliced up yes. for like, uh, you know, tomatoes and mozzarella kind of thing. I'm sorry. You said it comes from a buffalo. Yeah, milk of a water buffalo. You know what? Yeah. Never heard of it. Gotta <laughs> try it. It's All right. delicious. 
gorgonzola, mm. mozzarella, pecorino. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's a sheep smoked cheese. Sheep smoked. Similar to Parmesan. Nice hard, sharp cheese. Oh, a little God. nutty flavor almost. Uh, really good. Vegan mozzarella. Yeah. Once Is again, that tofu-ish? Uh, so, I mean, it, what's amazing about this brand, so we use, uh, it's called Follow Your Heart. It's a pretty big, popular vegan brand. Um, it's a soy-based mozzarella, and it's just got really good flavor, actually, and it melts really well. So, like, it's one of the better, like, we've been through a few, you know, options, and that's the one that kind of locked it in with us because people seem to really enjoy it. Like, it tastes like cheese and it you know, feels like cheese. Some of them almost, like, some other brands will, like, almost stick to your mouth because yeah. it's this weird gummy kind of texture. Oh, yeah, I've tasted no, that. This is good. Awesome. Now, yeah. let me just guess. Berreria tomato sauce. Made with beer. You got it. All right. right. Oh, my God. Does it have to <laughs> sit overnight or uh, is that proprietary? You don't talk? No. So, I mean, uh, we, you know, blend this down with uh, beer, onions, garlic, salt, pepper, um, and we actually, you know, cook out the alcohol. So we, you know, cook it just enough to kind of boil out the alcohol and turn it into more of like a, it's more of almost like a marinara sauce. Uh, so that's uh, like one of the sauce options. The traditional sauce that normally comes on a pizza is the Paradiso tomato sauce. I see. That's a, more of like a chunky tomato sauce just with some simple salt and pepper. Oh, sauce. my gosh. I hope everyone listening <laughs> is getting like a visual picture of how delicious. And I have to say that it is super, super delicious. So besides pizza, I know um, beer choices, bottle, handcrafted pizza— is there anything else on the menu? Yeah. So it, we, we've always had, you know, salad options and various appetizer options. And we've always carried multiple sandwiches, both vegetarian and meat options. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I discovered when we opened up our Spring Valley location, their most recent one that I'm currently running, uh, was that it's not just enough to necessarily special, like we do specialize and that is what we'll always be known for is the pizza yes. with, you know, the appetizers and sandwiches and salads. but having even more options for the whole family to yeah, come to, yeah. I think has become very important nowadays. Uh, and, you know, the, the family making decision where they're going to go. So we recently added uh, entree size salads with additional protein options um, at all of our locations. Wonderful. So for the, you know, for those that want to come get a pizza, but maybe someone else wants to just have a big salad. We yeah. got that for you now. Delicious. And, I'm a salad lover. Yeah. And we even added a kids menu recently. So oh, yeah. At least at our Spring Valley location. I think the other ones are entertaining the idea of that as well. We, we're most family based at the Spring Valley location. Okay. Uh, I get a lot of, you know, young kids and stuff. So we brought in some some small things for kids to eat now. That, awesome. And I'd like to also say that I'm reading at your website, eatyourpizza.com. Yeah. You guys are definitely a community institution that has partnerships with organizations focused on education and art. Mm -hmm. A lot to do with the schools, artistic ventures in the area. Anything that you'd like to share about those ventures? Yeah, so we are uh, kind of you know closely linked with a company called Artwork or Not-for-Profit Organization. Make sure I get that right. Um, called Artworks Now. Uh, we actually kind of share a building at our Hydesville location. Like one half is the Artworks Now organization. The other half is Pizzeria Paradiso in Hydesville. Um, and it's just uh, – that's a really cool organization that specializes in, you know, arts education for children and adults. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they do stuff in schools, but they also have like, you know, programs at their space. Um, and so that's just always been a nice, cool thing that we've partnered with. Uh, and they'll even like provide kind of like art kits for Aww. us for that will like pair with a pizza special or something oh, like that. Oh, that's so neat. Yeah. I love that. And I was just thinking about your rise in the company mm -hmm. where you've made a life from that. I'm not sure if you guys do um, community hours or anything in the summer where people are, um, young people are hired there that they can get the idea of working in a restaurant. That's just an idea to throw out there. They often come to where I work and ask for community hours, you know, high school stuff. So because you're so um, rich in the community. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's wow. a cool idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I definitely, we definitely, especially at the Spring Valley location, we have a lot of, you know, local kids always trying to apply and stuff like that. And oh, they, man. You know, 
lived just down the block. So it's yeah. always kind of cool to just like see yeah. them come in. I have some that I hired when they were, you know, seniors in see, yeah. high school and now they're seniors in college. And oh, man. they've been with me since we opened four That's years ago. That's a great legacy. Yeah. Your story is so great. So haven't vi- haven't visited your location yet. Um, you guys, you know, pictures on the wall or your story, because your story would be a great story <laughs> to know, honestly, yeah. to feature there in the store because I think working in retail and retail management for years, people just look at it as just like, it's a quick gig. Mm. A great turnover in retail and restaurant. Yeah. But um, I don't think a lot of people capture the idea of the family yeah. support benefits mm-hmm. that they can grow into that is someplace that you want to may want to stick around. So yeah. that's just an idea. I love it. I love the family feel and um, kudos to the the owner. Yeah. So is there anything else that you'd like to share for your um, podcast featuring uh, Pizzeria Paradiso? Yeah, well, I mean, I think one of the other cool things and like my story isn't, at least at this company, isn't as unique, at least in terms of growing with the company and, and you know, uh, building a life with the company, uh, so many of our, especially our back of house staff, mm-hmm. uh, have been with the company longer than I have, you know, uh, some of our, like our executive chef who's been there probably for, I think like 25 years, possibly Man. longer than that. And we've only been open for, well, only, only been open for 30 plus years now. Um, you know, he started as a dishwasher and just wow, grew up and is now in charge of the kitchens at all four locations. That's um, great our kitchen manager at Spring Valley and his brother actually have been with them for, I think over 15 years That's and great. started as, you know, chefs and just kind of worked their way up as well. So That's a great legacy. Yeah. I mean, the, the amount of support, like she's specifically like, you know, what I love about Ruth is and how she takes care of this company and, and how she takes care of her staff is that she really does care about every single person in that building, both customer and employee but she starts with the employee because we're the ones that she trusts to take care of the customers. So yes. if we feel supported and loved, then we'll, you know, translate that onto them. Yeah. She goes so far as she's got four locations still and hundreds of employees at this point. She still writes a birthday card for every employee. Wow. You might not get it on your birthday, but you'll but get, you it still that get it that month. Oh, that's so kind. Yeah. That's so thoughtful. Yeah. That's see that what that's what makes the difference in when you hear about, you know, corporate America. Um, business is business is business as far as the numbers. You want to grow, you want to expand. But when it comes to those little things right there, that is is you'll hold on to that for a lifetime because this person that um, owns this company thought enough of me to do that. That's great. Yeah. I really like that. Yeah. And I don't think I even necessarily answered all your specific question about Ruth, but it's just, you know, I can you know, go on for a while about how, you know, what a great employer she's been and, yeah. you know, the, the things she's done to really kind of take care of her staff, you know, the, the stress and just pain that she went through when, you know, early in the pandemic, we had to go to just carry out and, you know, you could see it and feel it, you know, how much it tore her apart to have to say like, I oh yeah, we can't keep you here right now. It's literally not safe. You know, as soon as we can, we want to bring everyone back. Um, you know, she did, you know, had to do a sad zoom message just because, you know, we couldn't all gather to talk about it. Yeah. We would, you know, in the past do uh, company picnics and company, you know, Christmas parties, Yeah. Uh, you know, a couple times a year. It's just, and the fact that we couldn't gather anymore was just this weird thing that just kind of broke her up inside. So, you know, the fact that we finally are getting time to see each other again and hug her in person, it's been really cool. Oh, um, yeah. Bring everybody back together. Yeah. We're, are we officially out of the pandemic? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. Oh, that's it doesn't seem like it's quite there yet, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, that's like, a wonderful yeah. thing. Uh, I, anybody, come a long way, we'll say. Yeah. So are you guys available on the uh, Uber Eats or... Mm-hmm. Uh, DoorDash yeah. and um, what is it? Postmates. Yeah. So great. Well, funnily enough, uh, Uber Eats bought Postmates. Their platform oh. still exists, but Look it's there. just their, Didn't know that. Yeah, it's just their Uber Eats drivers delivering for Postmates now. It's kind of funny. Gotcha. Um, yeah, we're on DoorDash, Postmates, Uber Eats. Some of our locations are Grubhub as well. Okay. Um, we just use third party for delivery, but otherwise we can do carry out and 
all of our spaces do dine in. Our Spring Valley location does actually do reservations, okay, uh, which can be done on our website, or you can call in to us, and we're happy to do that as well. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the pizza for our event. Definitely. Thank you for taking the time out today to come in. Mr. Mm-hmm. Tony Strout Hamilton of Pizzeria Paradiso and an artist of the <laughs> Renaissance Fe- um, local Renaissance Festival in our area. A great guy. And if you're interested in trying the pizza, go to eatyourpizza.com. Kind of like eat your veggies, but eat your pizza. I know. When I heard it, I was just like, it's like a mom, eat your pizza. Eat your pizza. Exactly. I, I, I love that was it. Where it came from. <laughs> so thank you guys once again for um, allowing us to come to you with another great, great interview. And we'll see you next time on the Hub Podcast, presented by Capital Workspaces. Yeah.